Thank you very much, um, you all, for being here. Thank you for the invitation for this nice conference. Um, actually, my talk is a little bit less specific. It's actually um, a broad view of one of the research line um, from my group. So this is the main topic, the electrochemical conversion of glycerol into energy and carbon new compounds and using microfluidic systems. And firstly, I would like to apologize for my English and my accent. So um, before starting, I just would like to let you know who, who I am. So this is, this is me. Uh, I graduated from the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul. So I got, um, I spent time in Argentina 2013. After that, my a part of my graduation um, was done at the Arizona State University at Biotime. Um, institute. So I got a um, tenure track position at this uh, another um, at this other federal university in 2014. I spent a little bit more time after that at the Arizona State University. Uh, I conducted postdoctoral research at the Simon Fraser University, Site Power Tech, uh, where I saw this um, hydrogen storage uh, investigation. I just asked um, uh, our colleague, and right now I'm working here at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, where I graduated, but inside the Physics Institute. Uh, so this is me. Uh, about the topic, the main idea is uh, that, glyce that glycerol comes from, for example, from biodiesel. So 10%, 10% of the whole biodiesel production is glycerol. So just uh, the, the context, uh, in my country, Brazil, so we have this increasing production of biodiesel because we use 10% right now in a mixture with diesel in our cars, in our vehicles, right? Uh, so from 2020 to 2021, it dropped a little bit because of obvious reasons um, due, due to the pandemic and, and so on. But right now it's increasing again. But just considering 2021, this is the production of biodiesel biodiesel and, and only in Brazil considering our regions, right? So my state is this one, Mato Grosso do Sul, the state I'm working right now, it's here in Middle West, right? So just considering my state in the Middle West, we got 1,400 liters of glycerol in the market. And there is not um, a huge market. We, 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 we need to find ways to use this to um, make some profit out of this, uh, especially to make biodiesel even more viable, right? So this is the market of glycerol in the world. This is from 2019, but it's a big picture of this, this whole market. So as you can see, uh, Brazil, Germany, Indonesia are the biggest uh, sellers of glycerol in China is the, uh, the biggest buyer. So glycerol is it's used for tobacco um, companies and mainly in pharmaceutical companies. So um, as you can see, it's quite interesting for, for, for um, Brazil and the whole South America actually to try to use it um, to, uh, um, to, to give uh, an application for this alcohol, right? So one of the applications that we've been trying to do for 13 years, been trying to use glycerol to convert energy and carbon new compounds for um, um, 13 years. So the point is um, to use it in uh, alcohol fuel cell. It's quite hard because it's hard to break CC bonds from this glycerol, from this um, um, alcohol. So the efficiency, it, it decreases because of that. Right, because we cannot convert it easily to CO2 to get um, to harvest more electrons out of that. But you can use this to convert carbon new compounds, for example. And uh, purified glycerol uh, has this um, less than 35 cents per uh, gram in the market, and some compounds go through from six um, um, US dollar per gram to more than 18,000 as it is for um, the purified hydro, uh, hydroxyuric acid. So this is something we can do and we've been doing, right? For example, using glycerol in electrolyzer, so we are um, uh, 
using energy for this non-spontaneous uh, reaction to, to happen. So we can convert glycerol, for example, into tartaromate. So we can convert money, right? So we can convert less than 35 um, US, less than 35 cents per gram to more than uh, six um, um, US dollar per gram, just using an electrolyzer conventional one um, and the palladium nanocubes as anode. To convert energy is a little bit, mm, it's not that easy, as I told you, it's hard to cleave it, the CC bond, but it's possible if you use a high temperature fuel cells, for example, this solid uh, oxide fuel cell fed by, by dry glycerol. We, we can use some usable, let's say, like that, usable energy out of that. So why is it so difficult to convert energy with glycerol? It's because um, there's several um, variables, right? Uh, it depends on the pH, the temperature, the, the ionic immobility, and mainly on the catalyst. So um, different catalysts will lead the reaction for um, toward different pathways, right? And uh, so we have several pathways. We are still um, um, studying that. We use it single crystals to several different nanoparticles using FTIR and EC2 and online HPLC and it's still difficult to, to, to understand, to realize the whole reaction. And, but what if we increase collision factor for this reaction? I mean, what if the, the product, for example, the glycolate um, uh, encounter another active site and uh, electro to be electro oxidized again and again and again. So three Ps increase collision factor. We can harvest more electron, right? So we can do that using microfluidic system. Uh, microfluidic system just um, an overview, the big picture of the system. I, I, I'm not quite sure if you were from the, uh, if you know about the system. So it works exactly as a fuel cell where. Um, the fuel is going to be oxidized at the anode, and the oxidant will be reduced at the cathode. And we have um, something to allow ionic um, um, transport. But instead of having like um, a nafoil membrane, membrane, we have nothing. We have just two liquid going through the uh, microchannel with a very low Reynolds number. So we have two laminar flow. Uh, making this columnar channel and the ionic transfer um, happens at, at, at the, this interface of the, 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 the two um, laminar flow. So we don't need the membrane anymore. Uh, it's like the two rivers encountering, but not mixture, right? Just to, for, um, for you to understand a little bit more, you can see the, the blue ink in this video and the yellow ink. You can see the blue and the yellow going through the microchannel, but you can also see a green, which is the, 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 the change in color at the interface of this to, to uh, laminar flows. So using microfluidic fuel cell, we exclude the use of membrane. So the ohmic drop is excluded and the price, the cost of using the membrane and the, the, the difficulty in handling it, it's, uh, they are all excluded. Um, that, but the most important thing is we can use mixed media um, quite cheap way. Uh, if we are going to use mixed media in a conventional fuel cell, you will need a bipolar membrane. It's, 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 it's not that easy to work and it's also expensive. But here you can optimize each half cell reaction. For example, you can perform the electric station in alkali media and the reduction in acidic media just considering Nairn's equation. So you will be optimizing the efficiency of the overall reaction and it's not expensive. And going back to the need for the increase in collision factor, you can use flow through catalysts. For example, if you um, engineer this, if you engineer the system like this, the, the reactants will go through a uh, um, conductor like any gas diffusion layer, for example, carbon paper with commercial platinum on this and the, react the reactants will interact with this, this um, catalyst in a more efficient way. So 
we can use glycerol right now to get high power out of this. Just to let you know, this is the, the way of working with this microfluidic. They are mainly made by PDMS, and we use the thermal paper with the nanocatalyst on this, or electrodeposited catalyst. I mean, um, depends on how you want to work. And we put the, the, the reactants going through their pump it uh, through this micro systems. So it's, it's a little bit easy to work with this. This is the overview, the scenario of the microfluidic use of that by alcohol. And this is glycerol in this scenario, right? Just a few papers until 2021, actually it was published in 22, but it's until the end of 21. But just a few papers mainly regarding new anodes and uh, most of this, these papers regarding commercial platinum and also um, people trying to understand um, how it works using different oxidants like liquid oxidants better than just oxygen and this is the output power for the systems fed by methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol and glycerol and I put this uh, just to let you know how powerful glycerol can be the state of the art was um, um, methanol fat system but right now glycerol is the best um, uh, it performed with the highest output power more than 300 millivolts per square centimeter and this is one of um, our works so we fed the system with glycerol and uh, um, hypo hypochlorous acid in acid media or hypochloride in alkaline media and this is the performance right so using an al alkaline system, we got more than 7 um, millivolts per square centimeter, but using mixed media, which is uh, possible only using membrane-less systems, membrane systems like this one, uh, we got the state of the art um, output power, um, 315 millivolts per square centimeter, considering all microfluidic fuel cells fed by all groups, right? I'm considering one single and few cell, not a stack. And uh, right after that, oh, just one more interesting point. We use the hypochlorous acid from bleach, from commercial bleach. Uh, and we, we got it just using commercial platinum as anode and as cathode. And the performance is the, the state of the art, even considering conventional direct glycerol fuels. We also uh, developed a fuel flex microfluidic fuel cell. The aim here was trying to um, allow the user to exchange in between different outputs, for example, methanol, ethylene glycol, and glycerol depend on the, on the fuel and price in the market. So we realized that if we control the number of, of oxidizable um, carbons feeding the anode, we can find a way of giving similar performance. I mean, we can get from 30 to 40 millivolts per square centimeter by changing the fuel. So it's a fuel flex system. Um, now, regarding new cast catalysts, probably anyone can try to understand the performance considering different materials by using classic uh, ways of working. Um, meaning you can synthesize, characterize, and changing the carbon paper using deep coating, spray coating, and so on. But we are dedicated to change the material, the materials in situ. Um, so we just uh, um, flow uh, precursors, modifiers, um, through the gas diffusion layer, for example, the carbon paper. So the modification will happen, um, will be done exactly where it's needed. So my point is, if you use, an, an, uh, for example, uh, a palladium chloride to modify carbon paper or to modify um, platinum already um, at the anode side, you will change the platinum exactly where the reactants will flow next when you were used 
So the advantage of this in situ strategy is to modify the catalyst exactly where it's needed. It avoid wasting precursors. Uh, it works for uh, you can apply potential for that, or you can do that electrolyze. Someone uh, wants to talk to me. Maybe something. It's everything okay, so I'll keep going. Uh, and can be um, applied for any existing cell. It's a it, disadvantage. It is it works well for flow through system. If not, if it's a, it is a flow over or a flow by. You will waste a lot of reactants, right? So just to show you an example of this modification, you can even control the mass of the electrode deposited um, and modify it. For example, we modify we use it um, chlor iron chloride chloride to modify plate, and you can control the charge or you can change the mass of the modification on top of the, the catalyst just controlling the concentration of the precursors and the flow of uh, the reactants so and you can get some improvement in terms of power density um, using the system just as an example we use we perform a measurement using glycerol and oxygen fuel cell and the performance um, go from 40 to more than 50 millivolts per second. Uh, using electroless systems, we, we modified a cathode, a bare carbon paper cathode using graphene oxide dispersion. So we, we synthesize it graphene oxide, we use it, we, we, we made a a uh, uh, well uh, due dispersion and we just pump this graphene with water at the cathode side and just water at the anode side so we got this quite um, uh, controlled modification so this is the, the carbon fibers and the graphene wraps make this kind of blanket coverage of the carbon fibers these are not nanoparticles these are just defects as you can see but we focus on this defect to show the this wrapping effect so using glycerol electrostation at the anode side um, using platinum commercial platinum at the anode and methyl free cathode we got this quite high um, performance higher than 100 millivolts per square Centimeters. So this this work is interesting because we use it, um, hypochlorous acid as an oxidant. So uh, we can uh, improve performance by changing just the chemistry, not exactly the material. Because even using bare carbon paper, uh, we got a very good uh, um, performance, even better than our own works using advanced materials. So just we, uh, uh, the, the increase in area was enough to increase performance for a methyl on free cat. And we are also 3D printing um, this glycerol microfluidic fuel cell. We've been working in advanced 3D printing science, so we decided to print the microfluidic fuel cell. It's it actually, it's, it's easy to do that. So using fused deposition modeling with the um, widely commercially available and uh, not expensive at all, at all, the technique for 3D printing, we 3D printed this micro channel, which is um, 150 micrometer high, and we use a carbon paper modified with commercial platinum catalysts, uh, and we fed this system with glycerol in alkaline media and hydro hydrochlorous acid um, in sulfuric acid media at the cathode side. So this is the system. This is the first 3D printed microfluidic fuel cell. It's quite small, as small as you can see. <coughs> the kilometer flow it's stable, and the output power it's quite high. It's higher than the than than. Um, 150 millivolts per square centimeter. It's exactly the configuration of that state of the art we got before, but right now we are not dealing with PDMS and glass. So the microfluid, the, the mechanics is a little bit harder to deal with. 
So we must improve the, the plastic, the, the surface of the plastic to increase the stability of the columnar flow to get that high, very high performance. And we're also um, working in paper based direct uh, glycerol microfluid in fuel cells. So this is the system. It's very hard to see, but here uh, we can understand a little bit uh, easier the system. Here, uh, instead of, of pumping using a syringe pump to pump the reactants, we use just the capillary um, characteristic of paper. So we fed this system with glycerol in alkaline media and the sodium, uh, sodium persulfate in acidic media. And the catalysts are bare carbon paper as cathode and the platinum on carbon paper as anode. Here you can see the copper foils used for electric contact and this printed piece just to press um, the system for experimental control actually. Once it is optimized, we can just use paper for, the, for a disposable and glycerol microfluidic fuel cell. And this is the, the direction of the flow. And we got a very good performance for a paper-based disposable microfluidic fuel cell. And using one molar, um, a glycerol at the anode side, we got an uh, output power higher than 3 millivolts per square centimeter. Now going to the, the last work uh, about this topic, we, we converted chemicals to right? uh, energy and chemicals in, at zero bias, so using a, a spontaneous reaction. We modified platinum at the anode side with bit that's it. So just flowing bismuth and alkaline media, we modified this platinum surface using in situ modification, uh, but in an electrolysis strategy, just just leaving the bismuth for um, exponential deposition. We got this uh, homogeneous modification of bismuth on top of the platinum, and we also use in operando in operandi strategy, which is uh, we put the modifiers with the glycerol. So uh, the aim is to produce energy and to keep the modification. But the cover degree is too high and this structure um, appears. We, we, we didn't expect that. This needle-like dendrite um, surface and the cover degree is too high. So actually, it's kind of the materials for the surface reaction. So this is the, the last um, um, result I'm going to show you. So uh, with this bismuth modified platinum anodes, the performance is increased, right? But the, this high cover degree anode is is it's a, it's deleterious. We, we investigated that before using absolute measurements, so we knew actually, and we also investigated the products. The conversion using the unmodified anode, it's slow because of the CO poisoning, but as the surface is poisoned, we could find more um, carbonyl compounds, so glycolate and formate. And for this in situ modified uh, um, anode, the conversion is high, which is good, but it is high, so glycerol goes through carbonate in alkaline media. So it goes to carbonate and we, we found um, um, less glycolate and formate. A little bit formate um, uh, was found because it is, it's, it's close to the end of the reaction, right? So it's the, if the conversion is high, we found more carbonate and more carbonate, formate, sorry, and less glycolate and intermediate um, um, results for this high cover degree and uh, modified anode. This is just a, an illustration to show that the, the conversion is low with the platinum anode and it's high for the well um, distributed um, bismuth modified platinum catalysts. So um, that's it. What we what, um, would like to show you hopefully in um, time to 
quite fast ratio in my group. It was created in 2014. Um, we operate here in Campo Grande, which is the capital city of Mato Grosso do Sul. We have borders with five other states and borders with two countries, Bolivia and Paraguay. This is my, this is my group. Uh, Campo Grande is a small city, one million people. It's a flat city with lots of parks and lakes. It's quite, it's quite comfortable for living. This is the size of my group. And I would like to thank you very much, the chair, um, for being here, you all for being here with us, and uh, especially for Igor Dikin for that invitation. I also would like to thank the public fundings and the private fundings of uh, my group, and also our private uh, interaction uh, with another uh, companies. So thank you very much. If we have time, I'll be glad to answer you um, any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for an interesting presentation. Please ask questions if you have some. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. So it's pretty close to, the, to my interests. Just a question about the, the stability of your, um, you use the, the microfluidic uh, fuel cells just as prototypes to investigate, not as future or applicable materials. And anyway, what is the stability of your anodes and your cathodes? Yeah. Because I remember to have worked on uh, low temperature fuel cells using hydrogen as, a, as the combustible material. And we had a lot of problems with the platinum decomposition. Sure. Because sure. even sure. it's known to be a noble material at the cathode, it undergoes nevertheless oxidation, decomposition, and anyway, it's too expensive. So what about the stability of your kind of materials? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the, this interesting question. We have um, a lot of trouble with stability, as you, you well know. Um, the point is, um, firstly, we, we, we develop, uh, actually I have here in my presentation, we develop a new way, maybe it helps, of um, material deposition. For example, for the ex situ strategy of investigating new materials, uh, we suggest using um, sonic bath for the dispersion because we have problems with um, yeah, um, deep coating and spray coating. So we just make an ink with the, the new catalyst and methanol, of course, and the traditional 5%, right? So we put this in the sonic bath and the carbon paper inside of this. So it, it, it increases the physical stability at least. So during the flow, the flow will not um, 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 release, we will leash the catalyst. But using the in situ strategy, this one I think is a, is, is a best way of um, making microfluidic systems for chemical and energy conversion. It might, it, it's not the best way to investigate new materials, but it's a, a smart way of building systems, right? So this is my, my uh, main uh, points regarding stability and uh, considering the physical modification, we use just water for this one, just mm -hmm. water, and water and graphene oxides. But the graphene oxides wrap the carbon paper. My guess is, uh, if we, if you use um, um, graphene oxide, a uh, modified graphene oxides or carbon nanotubes, you will need also nafion for that. But and, and the, the last, your last point is the platinum stability is the same for any system. So the same, the same problems we face with platinum in conventional fuel cells, we, we face here. There's, uh, so far, there's no way of um, surpassing this challenge. So if you do like um, an investigate, analytical investigation, you will see lots of platinum going, going no, no. <laughs> to, at, the outlet, at the outlet, right? What, so, what are you thinking about our catalysts? For instance, non-metallic catalysts. I know there is some literature about this topic, and, but if you use enzymes, you have all kinds of problems. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the pH stability and so on. So do, do you really believe, I, 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 indeed I, I left this research topic. I was working on that five, six years ago. Nice. Do you feel we will reach the goal to have huge scale systems which are stable for five, six years without more than 20% <laughs> reduction in the power density during that time? Do you think it's reasonable to think about that? It, it, yes, there is a way and we can just copy the photocatalysis field. I will okay. let you know about it. Uh, but just, just to let you know, I, I tried to work with enzymes and they gave up um, <laughs> three, four years ago. I, yeah, I literally, uh, I, I mean, I, I gave up because I need a, a quite good collaborator um, to do that. Um, we were not able to start and learn. It, it was time consuming. But considering um, the, these systems, I think it, it, it's doable in practice. Um, the point is, um, especially with these ones, uh, my point is if we copy the photocatalysis field, we must scale out the systems, not scale up. So if, we, if, you, want to go, if you want to get a huge output power out of that, you, you can scale that, but not increasing size because we will face new problems in concentration diffusion and temperature diffusion at least, and lots of other, right? But if you scale out, like um, engineering several microfluidic systems for chemical or, or and energy conversion, you can work with this. So we are doing that right now with uh, colleagues from electric engineering. So um, you can you you can uh, um, uh, do alerts. Oh, this system is not working. So just take it off, keep it working, change it, do the the the, uh, the replacement you must do, and put it back. So it's the same for solar panels. But 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 we have not been looking at solar panels so far. But it's the same. Like only forty five cells working, and that's it. We are safe. So the same for these microfluidic systems. I, my guess is scaling out it's doable commercially okay thanks for the explanations thank you very thank much you very much